Bibles tonight to Job chapter 12, where we'll be beginning. Job chapter 12. And as we prepare for our Bible study tonight, let us pause, reflect on the importance there is in what we do each time we meet, and let us pray accordingly. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to freely meet, openly, publicly, and to fellowship around your Son, Jesus Christ, and your word, which is the mind of Christ. And Father, we think of those tonight in, on the, the uh, mission field and those in foreign countries who do not have near the freedoms that we enjoy and who are many of them under intense persecution, and we pray for them tonight. We pray for those fellow members of the one body, and we recognize that everything that happens to one member of the body of Christ affects the body as a whole. And so we pray Tonight, for suffering believers, we pray that you might tonight put us better in touch with the doctrine of suffering as it relates to believers, and we pray that we might gain an expanded perception of many things through the teaching of your word tonight. We pray that God the Holy Spirit would illuminate it clearly to those in this gathering and to the ones who listen by recording. We ask this in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. In our study of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 21, refers to the fall of uh, Israel to the Assyrians and implies that by A.D. 55, at the time he was writing to the Corinthians, that the spiritual gift of national tongues was by this time a warning of the national disaster on its way to Jerusalem and Judea. The doctrine of suffering for the believer in Christ is a doctrine that we've been looking into because it is very much related to the fall of a client nation. Paul was referencing the past fall of the northern kingdom of Israel and the coming fall of Jerusalem and Judea and the doctrine of suffering for the believer in Christ is very much in tune with where we are as a nation presently and these categories of suffering that the Bible presents as they are related to the believer are really the only means uh, these doctrines or categories as a whole uh, actually present the context, the only context in which suffering in the human race can actually be understood. And that is through 
other doctrines as well, the doctrine of the angelic conflict and the doctrine of the appeal trial of Satan. The five categories of suffering related to the believer leading up to evidence testing, which we've looked at and which we've been engaging in a study in in the book of Job, uh, national entity and the authorities who rule them have been established by God in Genesis 10, Romans uh, 13, verses 1 through 4, Daniel 2, verse 21, and Acts 17, verse 26. And these are necessary components by which we are to understand the doctrine of suffering as it relates to believers in Christ and the angelic conflict and the appeal trial of Satan and our role in that and the agenda which God has given us to fulfill our very own spiritual life. That's why we're here as believers in Christ tonight. Uh, God did not take us home to salvation the instant that we believed, although uh, selfishly speaking that would have been far better. There would have not been any more suffering, but he has an agenda for us to fulfill, and we are responsible to fulfill it, and he does not deny us our choice to fulfill it or not to fulfill it. Many don't, and they'll be in heaven forever uh, and uh, in a, a wonderful, eternal uh, situation of blessing. They will be lacking the greater rewards of blessing that some believers will uh, be inheriting. But national entity and the authorities who rule them have been established by God. Again, we have the, the establishment of national entities recognized in Genesis chapter 10. And those boundaries also recognized by Paul the Apostle in his dissertation from Athens in Acts 20 or Acts 17 verse 26 uh, Daniel's recognition that uh, he sets up authorities and he removes them in Daniel 2 verse 21 the recognition by the Apostle Paul in Romans 13 verses 1 through 4 that all governmental authorities, uh, who exist are established, actually set in place by God. Sometimes that is for blessing for a nation. Sometimes that is for punishment for a nation, depending on the uh, integrity of the populace of the nation. And, of course, uh, in under any given circumstances. Sometimes it can be for punishment for a given nation at times and, and uh, at other times. Uh, sometimes it can be for punishment at other times for blessing. But in Job 12 and beginning at verse 23, Job is, this is contained actually in Job's reply to one of his friends Zophar, but Joe notes correctly in Job 12 verse 23, he makes the nations great, then destroys them. He enlarges the nations, then leads them away. He deprives of intelligence the chiefs of the earth's people and makes them wander in a pathless waste. They grope in darkness with no light, and he makes them stagger like a drunken man. And these, of course, are, are symptoms of a declining nation. And 
as a gathering of believers in Christ tonight. They relate to us uh, more specifically in terms of a declining client nation, a, a great nation which has been used by God to bless the world, which has been a tremendous means of missionary enterprise, which has been largely uh, pro-Semitic, not anti-Semitic. And uh, we are, I do believe, in the exceptionalism of the United States of America and that we have been established as an exceptional nation, exceptional to the norm, because of the many Christians who were involved in the founding of this nation and because of the uh, positive volition toward the divine institutions of establishment such as uh, the free will, uh, freedom has been recognized, marriage, it has been recognized uh, largely until recently, marriage between man and woman because the woman was created for the man as the pattern for the human race and that was prior to the fall, and the woman is to be the helpmate to the man uh, when uh, people find their partners in the plan of God. The woman is to be the helpmate for the man uh, in the fulfillment of each partner's role with regard to the angelic conflict and the uh, appeal trial of Satan. And of course we are going down very quickly because uh, these principles and many other principles related to divinely established national entity have been rejected. But God has instituted the free volition. He's instituted the uh, marriage for the time of the fall, he's instituted the family, and he's instituted national entity and principles regarding each. So the, the fact that he sets up governmental officials and removes them and enlarges nations and takes them away is not with disregard to the uh, it, 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 it is with regard to how human beings play into it with their rejection or their acceptance of truth and their acceptance of of uh, divine levels of authority which exist in human life and regarding the spiritual life. It's all about humility. We'll be getting into that. But as far as what's going on here, this is, uh, this certainly is um, a, a statement of great impact uh, having great impact on, on myself anyway. He makes the nations great, then destroys them. He enlarges the nations, then leads them away. He deprives of intelligence the chiefs of the earth's people and makes them wander in a wasteless or in a pathless waste. And we see that happening with Congress. We see that happening with the presidential administration. We see that happening uh, with the Supreme Court. We see that happening in government from 
federal government all the way down to local levels of government. We see the, the loss of integrity, wholesale corruption, the rejection of divine truth, and we will fall by the principles exceptional as we have been as a nation, we will fall by the same principles as every other nation has fallen throughout human history. I'd like you to turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 15. Once again, remember, he deprives of intelligence the chiefs of the earth's people and makes them wander in a pathless waste. So we should not be surprised by the things we see on uh, the networks or, or cable news, how everything is topsy-turvy, everything is upside down, things... Uh, it, it, you could not make the stuff up and write as fiction the things that are actually happening in government. But this should not surprise us because that's exactly what God does. But the wonderful thing is it really doesn't have to mean all that much to us because as believers in Christ... He has given us our own, our very own spiritual life to fulfill, and he's given us all the provision necessary to fulfill it. And the spiritual life that God has given us is able, under the right conditions, to withstand anything that's going on in the world, national disaster, global disaster, economic turmoil, economic disaster, and so forth. And in Jeremiah 15, Jeremiah said this in uh, the first part of the verse, Jeremiah 15, verse 16. Jeremiah 15, verse 16, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. Now, Jeremiah was a man who suffered greatly. Jeremiah was a tremendous servant of God, one of the, one of the greatest servants, and, and servants with the most humility, and the and the most compassion and tenderness toward people who is recorded in the bible jeremiah went through some very difficult times and was rejected continuously by the people but he did not re rely on people for his happiness and he said, your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. And the Hebrew word for heart, lab, corresponds to the Koine Greek word for heart, cardia, and they, they are both referring to the mentality of the soul. And Jeremiah was actually presenting the metabolism metaphor that the same thing 
that happens physiologically with the food that we eat, whereby the food we are eat the food that we eat is transformed in our body and transformed into energy. And the same thing happens with the Word of God. And Jeremiah actually uses the illustration of eating. Your words were found and I ate them. And your words became for me what? Transformed into energy. And the specific energy described here is a joy and the delight of my heart. Bible doctrine, and, and when I speak of the subject of Bible doctrine, it is not, uh, it is not dry theology. It is not theological concepts debated among theologians. It is the practical categories of instruction in the Word of God. Bible doctrine in the soul is the key to being to uh, to being the most complete or the the key to possessing the most complete happiness which can be enjoyed by a human being. I'll say that again because I kind of stumbled a little bit, but Bible doctrine is the key, is the very means by which we may receive the most complete happiness known to man. Bible doctrine in the soul produces a happiness which is impervious to pressure from circumstances or from people. Now we can allow this happiness to be attacked, which Job did after uh, functioning wonderfully through uh, chapters 1 and 2 up to the point at which uh, he was uh, told by his wife with bitter sarcasm that he should curse God and die. Uh, he was, he loved her with the unconditional love that is beyond what simp what simple personal love relationships can exist upon. But through his uncondi unconditional love, he ministered to her in such a way which was not condescending, it was not arrogant, it was not holier than thou, but it was in a loving way, but he reminded her of the integrity of God and how we should have gratitude both for good circumstances which we enjoy and adverse circumstances which come our way. And there is a principle by which God actually shares his own happiness with certain believers in Christ. And that is, you talk about miracles, that's one of the most miraculous things going, I believe. God sharing his own happiness with believers in Christ who are willing to adhere to the principles by which that happiness may be received. And of course, that happiness can only be received by grace. But God is happy, says the Bible, 1 Timothy 1 verse 11, to makariu theu, the happy God. 
And the happy God in 1 Timothy 1 verse 11 is not referring to happiness as emotion, but a consistent status, uninterrupted status related to God's unchangeable attributes. In fact, that is one of his very attributes, unchangeableness. God is self-sustaining eternally. He is eternally unchangeable. He isn't up and down. And we've been able to, uh, over a period of the many of years, uh, the many years we've been together, we've studied the various attributes of God. God is truth. God is love. God is righteousness. God is just. And uh, God is infinite. God is omniscient. That is, he has perfect, eternal knowledge. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows everything that's happened. He knows everything that will happen. He knows everything that would have happened if uh, different conditions had existed. God is omnipotent. He has perfect eternal power. And uh, God is able to transfer his happiness into the soul of the believer in Christ. And the medium by which he does that The medium by which he performs that transfer is Bible doctrine. Your words, plural, were found. Your categories of truth, not just a verse here and there that hits me the right way. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. If you would turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 15. The Gospel of John, chapter 15. And this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to his disciples prior to the cross. John 15, verse 11. The Gospel of John, uh, chapter 15, verse 11. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. And there's the principle again. The word of God, in this case, the word spoken to his disciples during his earthly ministry. These things I have spoken to you So the words of Christ spoken, why? So that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. In John's first epistle, you can find John's epistles uh, just prior to the last two books of the New Testament, Jude and Revelation. And John wrote three letters, and let's turn to the first one. First John, chapter 1. First John, chapter 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands 
concerning the word of life. He's referring to himself and uh, the apostolic circle. Verse 2, and the life was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship, koinonia, participation with us. Participation in what? Participation in the facts that they had seen and proclaimed to their uh, John's readership. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that, and the best texts read this way in, the, in English translation, these things we write so that our joy, that is all of us together, we apostles and you who are under the instruction of the apostles, so that our joy, all of the joy of all of us, believers in Christ, may be made complete. That's sharing the happiness of God. And sharing the happiness of God is a means of problem solving in human life. And it is a means of problem solving When, while functioning in the spiritual life as we solve problems in the realm of human life. And that's why in Nehemiah 8, verses 8 through 10, what did the Word of God say in verse 10? The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You see, words, we, we call the Bible the Word. Jesus Christ is called the Word. He is the communication of God, the Word. And, and God the Father is communicating the word to his creation created by the word and the joy of the lord is your strength this is a part of his word this is a category of his word And it is a way of thinking, not emotion, though it will result in good emotion. But sharing God's happiness is a way of thinking and appropriating the joy of the Lord, which he shares with us freely through his word. How would we know about the joy of the Lord being our strength unless we receive that by faith through his word to us? We would not know, and we would be most miserable. Sharing the happiness of God is maintained through the retention of Bible doctrine and the application of Bible doctrine. Uh, I'd like you to turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 11. 
As I always say, especially when we turn to quite a few places, which I often do, uh, if you'd rather just sit and listen to them and trust that I will uh, read them accurately to you. And uh, that can be a bit of a stretch, but uh, I... I have acclimated to using my reading glasses once in a while now, so I th my accuracy has increased, I think, in reading the scriptures to you. Luke chapter 11. I'm just stalling now because I'm trying to remember the order of the Gospels. Luke chapter 11. And in Luke 11, I love this, this passage. It, it strikes my funny bone a little bit, but uh, because I think maybe it was the, it was the first instance of Mary worship. But in Luke, 11 verse 27 while Jesus was saying these things one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him and I can only uh, imagine the great emotion she must, must have had while making what she w w thought was a, a wonderful dramatic statement well let me get back to reading the text while Jesus was saying these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed, or let's not, uh, that always sounds too religious for me, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. And there was something very subtle that was happening here. Oh, that sounded like a wonderful compliment. And that certainly would have stroked the ego of, of many people, including many communicators of the Word of God today. But the focus of this woman was wrong, and the Lord gently rebuked her. But he said... And actually, I don't know how gentle it was, but it, it seems fairly gentle because we've seen the Lord when he wasn't so gentle. Like when he was driving the money changers out of the temple. But he corrected this woman in, in verse 28, but he said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. So, sharing the happiness of God is maintained through the retention and the application of Bible doctrine. And I think that we can all attest to that. And we, 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 we are continually tested on it. And we have our times of failure. And uh, any of you in this room uh, and any who may be listening by recording and, and most of you in this room and, and uh, many who listen by recording know me fairly well. And, and in knowing me, you know that I... Uh, I struggle with anxiety and I struggle with depression and it always seems like a, kind of a contradictory to me, a, a contradiction sometimes that I should be teaching the substance that I teach that, that deals with these very subjects. But all that I can tell you is that uh, 
I don't always apply the, the things which I teach, but when I do apply them, it, it makes a tremendous difference. And I have indeed been blessed. by sharing the happy, the very happiness of God through his word imparted to me. And my happiness is shaken. And by the way, this happiness is not ecstatics. That's not sharing the happiness of God. Sharing the happiness of God is enjoying stability of soul, and a genuine contentment in life on a stable basis that, that is not on the graph up and down, up and down, up and down radically. It, it may move like this a little bit, but it's, it's stable and it's a contentment and it induces an attitude of gratitude toward all who God is and all that he's chosen to reveal to us about himself. And so therefore the happiness of God is a happiness which is impervious to circumstances and to how you are treated by people. And this is where Job fell apart, not with his bitter wife, but with his friends who meant well and came to him and tried to give him the theology they thought was appropriate. They had some theology, and uh, they had some correct theology. It was just misapplied for the circumstances Job was under. But Job could have remained as he had remained under the, the, the pressure of his loss of prosperity and than his children, and all of this happening almost simultaneously, and uh, then the loss of his personal health, and he was in uh, tremendous discomfort, and had to put up with his bitter wife, who sarcastically told him, why don't you curse God and die? And he remained without sin through all of this, functioning in the right mental attitude. Then he became distracted by people. You could turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, and starting at verse 12, Paul in Rome under house arrest, chained to a representative of the Praetorian Guard 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The guards would take shifts and in uh, chapter 1, verse 12. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. 
And we find out that through this, uh, through these sessions of these guards being chained to the Apostle Paul, and uh, I can't really imagine Paul keeping silent about the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he talked like he wrote, it was uh, run-on sentences, which uh, the guard probably couldn't get a word in edgewise if he wanted to. And we find out that through these sessions in uh, the next to the last verse of the letter that some in Caesar's various, uh, some in, in Caesar's actual administration had become believers in Christ and were to be greeted. In verse 14, and that most of the brethren trust, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some to be sure as, uh, or I'm sorry, some to be sure are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. But some also from goodwill. Can you imagine people preaching Christ from envy and strife? I can because many people do today. Many who fill up stadiums. Their motivation is envy and strife. It's arrogance. And it's competition. And there were those who were in competition with Paul, although Paul was not in competition with them. Verse 16, the latter do it out of love. The, that is those who were preaching Christ, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, those who were preaching Christ from goodwill knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former, that is, those preaching Christ even from envy and strife, they were doing, the former proclaimed Christ, verse 17, out of self, selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What was that about? Well, in their selfish ambition, they were self-justified, and in their minds, the Lord was blessing their ministry. And here is the Apostle Paul, who was certainly... Uh, because of their arrogance, hard for them to take. They thought that by their overt success, their success that, that was in numbers and in visibly how God was supposedly blessing their ministries, they assumed that that would probably drive Paul crazy, who is sitting chained to a Roman guard. For two years. And so they thought they, those who were, were preaching out of self-ambition and with self-justification were actually, they were, they were fired up. Uh, the, the fact that Paul was in imprisonment actually motivated them to preach Christ all the more because they thought, oh, I, I'm great stuff. And here is the Apostle Paul 
sitting in a house, chained to a guard, constantly. I hear he's doing a lot of writing, but he can't get out there and speak and draw the numbers. So the happiness of God is a happiness which is Im impervious to circumstances and how you are treated by people because what was, what was the apostle's conclusion, verse 18, what then? That's just a, a quick way of saying, so what am I to make of all this? What am I to include? What then? What conclusions can we draw? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. And I love the repetition of the rejoicing with the two tenses. I rejoice now, present tense, and I will rejoice in the future. In other words, I'm making plans to continue to rejoice. And that's what I'm doing in my personal life in spite of the fact I don't always do it. I do rejoice, and often in the present tense I rejoice, and while I'm rejoicing I make plans to rejoice in the future, come what will. And that genuine joy that sponsors such rejoicing is only possible through the intake and the application of God's word. He goes on to say, "For I know, verse 19, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The deliverance spoken of, I think it may even say salvation in the King James Version, but it's obviously not eternal salvation. It is a word that's often translated salvation, soteria. It, it has a wide range of, of translation, rescue from danger, uh, uh, cure from illness, uh, all the way to um, rescue from death. And, of course, it is used a number of times for eternal salvation, that is, eternal rescue through the gift of eternal life. Here it is used not of deliverance through uh, death, because he's going on to say he wants... Christ to be exalted in his body, whether by life or by death. But here it is used as it is sometimes used in terms of vindication. For, and let's just use that word. For I know that this will turn out for my vindication through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and hope or confident expectation that I will not be put to shame in anything but that with all boldness Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body whether by life or by death. And we'll close there and meet in 10 minutes. Let's co close with prayer. Father, thank you for what you've given us so far. Thank you for the happiness that you are, you are 
so free to bestow upon us, that you so freely give us. And we pray with gratitude in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Okay. <laughs>